welcome also to those who are joining by live stream. Yes, this is being live streamed, so um, just, just know that, but I hope it won't in any way impede the kind of frank conversation that we hope we can have in this, in this room led by a very able moderator. Um, at Vital Strategies, we believe that every person ought to be protected by a strong public health system, and that is our vision and what we work towards. Today's event on addressing air pollution and the NCD response is critically important and integral to that, to that vision of ours. Air pollution, as many of you in this room know, uh, contributes to around 5 million deaths each year, and that's nearly one in every 10 deaths. It's the fifth leading risk factor for mortality worldwide, and the economic costs to the global economy are about $255 billion in lost labor income and over $5 trillion in welfare losses. These are obviously enormous costs. I'm doing the easy part today, which is just to introduce each of the people that you see before you, and then our very able uh, moderator, Dr. Sophie Gumi, um, will be doing the moderation and, and pushing people to uh, make tough comments and ask tough questions, including yourselves at, at the end. So let me start by introducing her briefly, and you know that you have the bios uh, on the flyers that we that we sent out and we've provided today, so I won't read the entire thing, but let me just highlight them by saying she is a team leader on ambient air pollution at the WHO. Uh, she oversees air pollution statistics and reporting and is responsible for implementing the WHO work plan on, on ambient air pollution and health. She also works towards enhancing the evidence for policymakers and building country capacity to address air pollution and its health impacts. We're really delighted that you could do this today. Thank you. Uh, let me then introduce next uh, Nina Renshaw, who is the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the NCD Alliance, where Nina leads the NCDA's global policy and advocacy work. For more than a decade, she's been engaged in a range of international policy areas, including the environment, transport, industrial policy, taxation, and health. And prior to joining the NCD Alliance, when we're very lucky to have her there, uh, she was based in Brussels as Secretary General of the European Public Health Alliance. I'd also like to introduce uh, Dr. Salavan Omar. He's the Senior Advisor for HIV Health and Development at the United Nations Development Program. Dr. Omar has over 20 years experience in health program management in Africa, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. He's currently a Senior Advisor at UNDP HIV Health and Development. He's also involved in UNDP's Solar for Health program, where he oversees the development and implementation of health sector access to renewable energy. Uh, I think our, fourth, our other speaker is not yet here, no? So I'll hold off on introducing him. Uh, so Dan Cass, uh, my colleague Dan Cass, is the Senior Vice President of Environmental Health at Vital Strategies. Dan's illustrious public health career has spanned government, academia, and civil society. He's been largely focused on reducing the burden of environmental disease in urban populations and has a team of epidemiologists, environmental scientists, scientists, and risk communication experts who work with government and civil society to address air pollution, heavy metals, and other toxic exposures. And even though he's not here, I'll just get his introduction said to you so that you know who he is when he arrives, and we'll tell him that we've already introduced him. Um, uh, Sri Lav Agarwal um, is the Joint Secretary for International Health, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare of India. Dr. Lav Agarwal is an officer of the Indian Administrative Service and has worked in various capacities over the last two decades, including as Director of Intermediate Education and Commissioner of Health in the government of Andhra Pradesh. He's presently posted as Joint Secretary to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So uh, Dr. Gumi is going to obviously lead off, uh, lead us off on a discussion about the impact of air pollution on health, uh, economies and development, and the steps needed to address air pollution as part of the global NCD response. After the panelists have spoken, we will open the floor to questions from the room. And, uh, and then hopefully we'll continue to have a robust discussion until the, uh, the time ends here. So thanks all very much for coming. And Dr. Gumi, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting WHO to moderate this interesting side event. Uh, we'll uh, briefly 
describe the plans of WHO uh, on uh, addressing air pollution and health issues. So as we speak, there is a side event uh, during the World Health Assembly uh, for the launch of a global health and energy platform of action. This, uh, the vision of this uh, platform of action is to accelerate the transition to clean energy to improve health and livelihoods. How and why we do that is because we want to strengthen the political and technical cooperation between the health and energy sector through uh, a multi-stakeholder platform that will gather government, civil society, UN and the private sector. Uh, the initial focus of this uh, energy and health platform will be on clean cooking and also uh, electrification of uh, healthcare facilities because this is essential to deliver good quality care. This platform is led by the by WHO and by UNDP, uh, with a, together with other key stakeholders, um, very um, active in the in the energy um, domain like uh, the World Bank, Arena, Sustainable Energy for All, the United Nations Foundations, and also the Clean Cooking Islands, but also many others. Um, the idea is to really to build a mechanism for enhanced cooperation among the health and the energy actors through the establishment of this multi-stakeholder health and energy platform of action. The, this EPA, this uh, uh, platform of action, has three main objectives. The first one is to really mobilize high-level political and financial um, attention with commitment to um, to support energy access. The idea is to, to, to compile a group of champions that can really advocate, raise awareness, and really try to mobilize financial, finance and, 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 and attention. A second, a second aim, a second objective of this platform is to build a consortium of energy and health practitioners to provide direct support to countries. WHO and UNDP are very well placed because they have countries' offices. So the idea is really to, 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 uh, to, to really support countries with a, with a direct link to technical cooperation, also again with a wide range of, of different actors. And third, the, the, the platform will develop and disseminate a set of health-targeted communication materials, focus on clean household energy and electrification for healthcare facilities, aim at local communities, building on, on existing um, raising awareness tools that, like, for example, the Breathe Life from the WHO and the other UN agencies, but also the work from other partners. WHO has been advocating since decades now on household air pollution. This is something that is very uh, important for, 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 the, for our agency and also for our director general. And uh, there is a, a, a lot of technical work that has been done and will be really disseminated through this, this platform. That's the idea. Um, a second topic I'd like to present to you is the WHO air quality guideline. As you know, um, WHO sets guidelines on uh, on air pollution level, air pollutant level, and uh, the, the WHO air quality guideline is currently being updated for a uh, um, for classical pollutant. This is a very long process, very rigorous process, and it has started uh, in 2016. It, the result of the guideline, the new guideline, will be most probably published next year. Um, this is uh, the, when this guideline will be published. WHO will be teaming up with the key stakeholders to uh, mobilize the health sector to disseminate and really try to implement as much as possible those guideline values. The process to update other guidelines, which are related, like for example the indoor air quality guideline for household fuel combustion, will be the process will be started to update those guidelines as well once the the new one will be published. Uh, third um, activity that is very dear to WHO uh, is the capacity building material for the health sector. Since the World Health Assembly resolution and the roadmap on air pollution, uh, there is a really a need to um, to develop health um, health training mat uh, training material for the health sector because they need to to. They need to get the knowledge, they need to get the tool to really advocate for, for, for air pollution and health. And this is something that is uh, on going on right now. The target audience is uh, not only public health, but it's clinicians, it's community health worker, and everybody in the health community that, can, that has a direct access to patients, but to, to the population and also to, 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 to other stakeholders that can really advance the agenda. On other activities, two months ago, WHO convened uh, an expert consultation on risk communication for personal level intervention, like face mask, indoor air filter, the, the benefit of doing physical activity, 
uh, in air pollution settings. And this was a very interesting uh, meeting where ev evidence was reviewed and uh, the, there was experts were providing advice on how to communicate this uh, to, to the public and to patients because it's uh, complicated. It's not the evidence is not necessarily there to, to derive the recommendations. So this is a this was a first milestone towards um, towards trying to advocate to, to educate the, um, the public on how to, what to do to protect health. And finally, WHO is now working on the 5 to 5 matrix to tackle NCDs. Now that air pollution is finally recognized as a risk factor and we are really working with, as with, again, with a wide range of actors to deliver a menu of policy options and cost-effective interventions. Thank you very much. I guess we will start with... Um, Lina? No? While we wait for Dr. Awad. Thanks, Sophie. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, as Sophie said, my name is Nina Renshaw, and I'm Policy and Advocacy Director at the NCD Alliance. So we're delighted to be here and we're really pleased that this week we're going to see that shift to the 5 by 5 approach for non-communicable diseases cemented. So air pollution is being added, it's being recognised as a major risk factor for a whole range of NCDs. Um, we've just published a policy brief on the uh, disease impacts of air pollution. Um, you'll find a few copies out there and if you were um, watching, especially the British media last weekend, you'll have seen an awful lot of coverage of that. That was born of a research paper that's been published by FERS, the Federation of International Respiratory Societies. And the headline was really that air pollution affects every organ in the body. It's may maybe not just the most obvious physical impacts that we can feel ourselves, but it really, at the cellular le level, it gets to every organ in the body and is doing maybe a lot more damage than what we may initially realise. So I think that was a great scene-setting piece for the discussions that the uh, decision-makers are going to be having to take this week. Um, as we all know, the death toll of air pollution worldwide is around 7 million, which puts it on a par with tobacco as a risk factor for NCDs and premature mortality. Air pollution obviously doesn't discriminate. There's 90% of us around the world, almost everybody, live in areas where the air quality is unacceptable, basically, and it's putting our health at risk. The great news about NCDs in general is that to some extent there are tried and tested solutions. Um, we know what policy measures work uh, to tackle, um, prevent and control the NCD burden. Um, and we know which ones are cost effective. These are called the best buys. They're in Appendix 3 of the Global Action Plan on NCDs. And thanks to a decision that we've taken here this week, there's going to be an opportunity to expand that list also to include the best buys and the recommended policy interventions for air pollution, which is great news. The best buys that we already have on the list, they, if they were implemented around the world, these are things like tobacco policies, um, things like policies to curb obesity. If we would just uh, implement those around the world, we could save 9 million lives by 2025. 9 million, and that's without introducing anything on air pollution. So imagine what we have to save. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, so that 5 by 5 the defining list of recommended interventions, I think for air pollution, we know already what the top candidates are going to be for that list. We have measures around the world that have been tried and tested in different resource contexts, both for indoor and outdoor air pollution. I think we should get used to the idea that that list is going to be a long one, because you need a whole recipe, a whole menu of different policy solutions for different contexts. And also that list shouldn't be set in stone. As we're trying things in the process, as we get the evidence base of what's cost effective online, we need to be able to add to that list continuously as well. Um, obviously what we're talking about is systemic policy change. It's not about these end of pipe solutions, people wearing face masks or taking, you know, buying air filters or whatever for their homes. It has to be systemic. It has to be upstream solutions. I think what's absolutely essential to remember is it's not just the stuff that we might think of off the top of our heads, industry, power generation, um, transport being the most obvious ones, but we absolutely <coughs> mustn't forget agriculture, which is one of the major contributors both to climate change and air pollution everywhere in the world. In parts of the world where we've done quite a lot about transport and energy already, vehicle emission standards, power plant emission standards, national emission ceilings, which have worked well, that means that relatively the share of agricultural air pollution is rising 
pretty dramatically. Um, so it's important to think of the things that might be out of sight, out of mind. So agriculture, waste, and the way we deal with our waste, um, shipping, aviation, as part of the transport sector, but also our shift to digital economies. I mean, all of this doesn't come for free in terms of emissions. While we're on heavily fossil fuel-driven <laughs> energy supplies, all of this is driving the air pollution burden as well. I think um, the message also that I want to leave you with is that um, as part of the best buys, we have some recommended interventions which are fiscal measures, so stacks, sugar, alcohol, uh, and sugar-sweetened beverage taxes. Now, we have to add into that range of measures to expand the fiscal space, which might also be increased fisc fiscal space to fund UHC. We have to include fossil fuel taxation in there as well. We have to tax the things that are damaging our health in order to make maybe some more space for things that can help our health. So whether to earmark or not to earmark, that isn't something that would be discussed here. These are obviously national uh, level discussions, whether you want to put the dividends from uh, taxation to UHC or not. There's been some tried and tested uh, experiences with this around the world. Some of these have worked better than others. And an important message is don't count on stable revenue. Don't become hooked on this as a revenue stream, as has happened in some countries for tobacco. Because if your tax works well, people will consume less, buy less, and your revenues will be diminished. So don't start counting on this as something that's going to be a, a fixture, a staple of your, of your revenue generation. So um, as a final thought, I think we have some high-tech and we have some low-tech solutions. We have solutions across all different kinds of re resource contexts. Um, these are very cost-effective. We're increasing that evidence base all the time. Investment cases can come online relatively quickly. What we need to make sure is that our cost-benefit models there can deal with massive co-benefits across other sectors. Obviously climate, but also social co-benefits, livable communities, road safety where we're doing things about transport and active mobility, personal safety where people, women, children can get out more safely into their communities and exercise as well. Um, and maybe local measures can also increase some city self-determination and we can get some really interesting experiences there from London, from Kigali, where there's a car-free day every month, from Medellin in Colombia, where there's bike paths and so on. There's a huge range of things we can do. Um, and we also have to think about all of this in comparison with the costs of inaction, which are completely you know, off the chart, and we're learning more and more about these every day. So we're not comparing to business as usual, we're comparing to a future where more and more people, more than 7 million every year, are going to die from the impacts. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nina. This was uh, well said. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Shri Angargaval, who arrived, and I invite you to join the podium. Please. Yeah. Um, distinguished delegates, diplomats, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset I am really sorry that I was slightly late to join this place and as is typical of finding solutions you realize that you are just running round and round and you still do not find what is most relevant and probably the easiest of the solution to find. So I was actually taking three rounds of the same building and campus <laughs> and I could not locate this building. So I think it sums up very well in terms of probably knowing solutions still why we are not able to achieve, you know, in terms of what we should be doing and how we should be doing. So I'm really sorry that I was late and uh, my Gratitude to Vital Strategies as well as the Non-Communicable Disease Alliance for taking up this agenda of putting air pollution at the center of public health agenda. Something which is very vital and in context of variety of problems in the health sector we are dealing with. Something which gets often neglected because we probably do not see the impact of this as an immediacy and we try to talk more in terms of programmatic interventions in various other diseases which we encounter. There are problems of air pollution related with both indoor as well as outdoor and as we are all aware that it is about industrialization, urbanization, depletion of forest cover, agriculture practices, high energy demand for the highly populous country, particularly countries like India with a population of around 1.3 billion. And uh, so with these 
as the challenges in front of us, with these as these causes in front of us, it is very important that from India perspective, which is what I would like to sort of highlight today in our discussion, that uh, we are also equally committed and concerned on the aspects of both mitigation as well as adaptation within the constraints of our limited sources and to work out with respect to ensuring healthy lives for our citizens. We actually had initiated working on air pollution probably at the highest level when we had a high level task force on air pollution which is headed by none other than the principal secretary to the prime minister's office and the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change is actually the nodal ministry under the Environment Pollution category and uh, they are the nodal ministry and under the uh, Environment Protection Act we actually had an environmental authority in the year 1998 which was started and we had taken a few initiatives which also include I would just like to cite out National Clean Air Program, National Mon uh, Ambient Air Quality Standards coming up with the National Air Quality Index, National Air Quality Monitoring Program, then graded response for highly polluted cities in India, primarily Delhi and the national capital region in and around Delhi. We had also come up with 42 specific points to mitigate air pollution in major cities of this country and also indoor air quality guidelines, biomedical waste rules for India. We also sort of realized that beside the outdoor air pollution for us, indoor air pollution, household air pollution is also equally important an area to work on. And with this being an objective, there is a momentous step which was taken up by the Honorable Prime Minister of India on 1st of May 2016, when we launched Ujjwala Yojana. Ujjwala is in Hindi, it means shine. So in this Yojana, we, in this scheme, we try to provide LPG connections to 50 million below poverty line families of India then the scheme aims to provide replace unclean cooking fuels mostly used in the rural part of this country with a clean and more efficient LPG. Delegates, as part of this commitment, we have also come up with from the Ministry of Health as a National Action Plan for Climate Change and Human Health and National Center for Disease Control is the nodal agency to take up this activity. And we are also coming up with the steering committee which is headed by a senior colleague in the ministry which is additional secretary of health who has multi-sectoral representation in terms of what action needs to be done on the issue of air, air pollution we started understanding and trying to create evidence on the air pollution and its effect on health in terms of that since 19 uh, november 2017 in and around hospitals of delhi we do daily surveillance of acute respiratory uh, illnesses in context with the air quality index of this particular town so as to understand and create required evidence. We have issued required advisories to the National Center for Disease Control on air quality index and the steps to be done accordingly. And we are trying to now increase the surveillance in 20 most polluted towns in the country so as to create the evidence and identify the adaptation measures. We through the Indian Council of Medical Research have also started a multi multi-site analysis which is effect of outdoor air pollution on acute respiratory symptoms in Delhi. Also health impact assessment in 20 most polluted cities and a zone based study has been initiated. There is also an effort in terms of creation of center of excellences. 10 such center of excellences have been identified in the country through which we are trying to identify health adaptation plan be it related with vector bond diseases, be it cardiovascular diseases, etc. So as to understand the linkages as well as the interventions which needs to be done at the field level. I would also like to highlight that uh, the major focus primarily is in terms of getting all ministries on board and as you would all kindly appreciate it is not only Ministry of Environment, Petroleum and Natural Gas, Transport, Agriculture as well as the local administrative bodies which all need to come together and uh, we need to identify the source of pollution and sort of take specific measures in terms of controlling that. Major corrective actions are also now in implementation phase. Like for example, checking pollution from construction sites, brick kilns, power plants, improvement in public transportation like metro and air conditioned bus, advocating vehicle pooling, promoting cycling, walking and other modes of transports which require less energy, ensuring mechanized sweeping of roads, controlling uh, in terms of burning crops and biomass etc. So these are few of those international uh, practices which we have put in place and uh, 
I would in the end only like to highlight this is a challenge which collectively we have to take. I look forward for again, you know, guidance from international experts, if not today, again over a period of time in terms of how we can collaborate together, learn from experience of each other and can make a meaningful impact into this sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal. This was very inspiring, and uh, India is leading uh, in many things, and uh, congratulations for all those efforts, and as you say, governance is a difficult issue. Um, now I invite Dr. Daniel Kass, please, from Vital Strategies. Hi, is that better? Hi. Um, I'm so delighted to be here, and thank you all for coming to this event. Um, you know, we organized today's event in part to mark the transition of the World Health Organization's 4x4 um, that describes key health outcomes and their risk factors to uh, now include a fifth outcome and a fifth uh, risk factor, of course, mental health and air pollution being the fifth risk factor. So I want to reflect in my remarks for just a few minutes on uh, what, now that air pollution joins its evil siblings of food, uh, physical activity, and alcohol, uh, and tobacco, what we've learned from the experience of trying to address those, and what will, I hope, accelerate action to rapidly and really substantially reduce ex emissions and exposures. So the first lesson that I want to highlight is that there are culprits in this fight. It's taken a long time for the global, global public health community to fully embrace the implications that many of the leading risk factors for non-communicable disease are actively promoted. The food industry, alcohol industry, tobacco industry, among others, are some of these culprits. Uh, addressing the health consequences of these risk factors or exposures can't succeed without changing their behavior, as well as the behavior of policymakers and the public's tolerance for it. The successes from, for example, the framework on tobacco and the progress being made with the Healthy Cities Movement helps us chart a path for how to address air pollution. And while the causes and the contributors to harmful air pollution differ by location and then purport, the proportion of what the specific sources may be, uh, we know globally that combustion is the leading cause of death and disability. In areas with the greatest population density, of course, it's the practices uh, and promotion of harmful and dirty fuels uh, for heating, cooking, energy production, transport that are principally responsible. And in rural areas, as you've heard, agricultural practices that promote land by clearing by, uh, by, clearing by burning um, and burning of crop waste endanger children, accelerate disease among adults, and contribute to climate change. Many of these industries actively sow doubt of science, they lobby for the status quo, and they intentionally confuse policymakers and the public to prevent actions that will require change to their commercial and their industrial practices. The second lesson I think we've learned is that the solutions must be both local and international. Cities and nations can make some really substantial progress by diversifying their energy toward greater renewability. Uh, they do and can invest in public transit. They may regulate local emissions. They can invest in waste collection that prevents uh, urban burning of waste. They can promote distribution systems for cleaner household uh, fuels. But we can't forget that there are global forces at work and there must be global action. Whether that's a set of global goods for technical assistance and financial assistance to countries and cities, uh, or uh, whether it's the fact that we have to uh, leverage more of the global, global climate funding for initiatives that have near-term benefits on emissions, we have to think internationally as well. And one other piece that I think is important, there, there's a real need for an international uh, uh, platform for corporate responsibility that will have to be demanded rather than just willed into existence. We need a global coalition to prevent manufacturers and multinationals from exporting from their home countries what cannot be sold or used there. High sulfur heating fuels, poorly manufactured or maintained cars without modern emissions controls or safety features, secondhand and retired diesel trucks, buses, and vehicles that pollute our cities, transport our children. Another lesson is, uh, like alcohol and tobacco, personal decisions matter, but, Air pollution is a classic externality 
the result of a market failure that fails to take into account the full societal and health costs of emissions. People cannot make personal decisions to eliminate the use of coal in power plants. They cannot choose to pay pu public transportation where it does not exist. They cannot cook with electricity where there is no grid. And we cannot expect the market to solve this problem on its own. The lesson from high-income countries is that regulation and legislation drives these changes, and it's critical that the global public health community do what it can to support these efforts in country and in major population centers. The, uh, the next lesson is that we must educate the public and change the discourse about air pollution. At Vital Strategies, we recently published a report called Hazy Perceptions, which are out in the front, if you haven't grabbed one. Um, we analyzed more than a half a million social media posts and news media stories about air pollution in 11 countries. And I invite you to read the full report, but a few highlights are noteworthy. Uh, public and journalist discourse about air pollution overwhelmingly discusses obvious, but not the most important sources of emissions for air pollution. And they focus on acute rather than chronic health effects. Uh, they rarely discuss solutions and they obsess about daily variation rather than continuous exposures. And I might note that health-based messaging currently around air pollution only encourages this by focusing on air quality and disease rather than chronic health impacts. We have to reorient this discussion or there will be little demand for truly health preventive policies. People engage more when air pollution's impacts on children are described, another finding from our work. So let's do more of that. The evidence is mounting about life course impacts from in utero through adulthood uh, stages of exposure, cognitive deficits, behavioral problems, school performance, stunting, and other effects capture the public's imagination and attention, but we need to do a better job of quantifying those. I'm happy to report that at Vital Strategies, we're working in Indonesia to do just that with UNICEF as a partner. Uh, Last lesson I want to focus on is that cities can be incubators and drivers of national level changes. We know from actions around the four by four that air pollution in cities, uh, rather that, um, that, uh, that urban action, that city action uh, makes a big difference. Air pollution in cities in the global south is worsening, populations are rising, energy levels are increasing, and impacts are rising as well. Uh, WHO, NGOs, and lenders need to focus on improving air quality in cities by empowering local actors, analyzing local impacts, and supporting initiatives that reduce local emissions. Actions in cities to elevate public concern are underway, both homegrown and supported from outside, but in many cities, more than half of all pollutants are emitted far outside the city, and even local emissions are not under cities' authorities to control. So cities should, cities should drive demand for national action, but they need help. We're at, we at Vital Strategies are completing an innovation guide for air pollution action by cities to help them harness recent changes in air monitoring technology, cheaper and more effective approaches for characterizing uh, the uh, key sources of air pollution and emissions, uh, evaluate local authority and set up multi-sectoral governance structures to act as we've heard about is happening in India and elsewhere. We know many of you in the audience are involved as well, but we really need the international lenders uh, and other uh, actors to specifically support sub-national action. And I just want to end by highlighting the fact that there are real differences between air pollution as a risk factor and the four previously focused on in the four by four. First, Health departments are really not well equipped to play meaningful roles on, in driving air quality improvements. We're so pleased that WHO produced its guidance for health sector engagement, but it needs to be implemented. Air pollution controls are, are implemented by energy, agriculture, city planning, transportation, uh, environmental sectors, not public health. But we know from the 4x4 that public health concerns are essential for driving change elsewhere, like in taxation and marketing and in food production. So how do we do it? Well, we have to use the tools of public health, surveillance, health impact assessment, economic assessment. Health ministries need to calculate their, uh, the true share um, of the costs of status quo air pollution to drive investment by government and rationalize the demand for expenditures by industry. Ministries can apply the tools of spatial analysis to help understand who is most vulnerable and who suffers most to prioritize actions on the greatest sources of air pollution. But to do this requires training in human resource investment in health departments and ministries. Although the good news is they're modest investments. A false dichotomy really exists in the minds of both the public and among elected officials that air pollution is an inevitable consequence of progress and that development efforts must trump public health. We must disabuse people of this, and, uh, of this notion. Uh, wetting air pollution to climate change control and mitigation will help, and I'm gonna leave it to our colleague from 
uh, UNDP to help us think through best how to do that. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for providing this useful insight. Now I invite um, <laughs> Dr. Omar, please, from UNDP. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, the organizers of this side event. It's very important, and I have a great pleasure to be with you today here. But to avoid repeating what the other colleagues in the panel just spoke about, and I would just would like to ask a question to the participants and to know how many of you are working in the other sectors like transport, energy, land planning, and agriculture. Just lift your hand. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> So the answer is clear, and the air pollution problem is driven by the other sectors and the policies of the other sectors. And there is a need for multilateral action if the health sector to address effectively the air pollution and NCDs. That has to be clear. We need more other sectors people in this kind of events. Because health sector is not the only contributor to the air pollution. I will talk about later on the health sector air, air, air contributions. Secondly, there is a gap in terms of data on the economic cost on inaction on air pollution, as Nina mentioned it, and UNDB has been doing for the last two, three years, a number of investment cases on NCDs on the behavior side, that is alcohol, tobacco, and lack of physical activities. We would like to expand that with other international partners and member states to agree on common methodology to measure what it means and the, in terms of economic cost on, on the inaction. Having said that, UNDB have been working closely with WHO and other international energy sector partners in implementing Solar for Health program, which I am overseeing it. In the last three years alone, we have managed to provide solar energy to more than 700 health facilities around the world. We have seen the impact that energy provided to health systems. The three key objectives or the mantra of the solar for health is saving lives, saving the environment, and saving costs. I will focus saving environment. We all know most of the health facilities are using either as a primary source of energy or as a backup system, the diesel generators. And that contributes to the CO2 emission. And it's expensive. I just came back two weeks ago from field assessment in Liberia, driving through those villages Every two kilometers, you see trees that are cut and burned to use for charcoal. When we reach it in the health facilities, they are all running expensive diesel generators. In most cases, they have two diesel generators. One is standby in case the other one dies. When we estimated even the cost of one health facility to have uh, solar energy, they will make that return on that investment in one year and a half but they don't have that initial capital to invest. It is easier for them to buy a few liters of fuel every day and contribute to the pollution. Secondly, we are running a program called Sustainable Procurement in the Health Sector, where we are trying to help member states, manufacturers, strengthening the supply chain of medicines and other health products. We hear that 
how many millions of people are accessing ARVs and TB drugs and malaria. But do we know what it means for the environment? From the packaging to the waste management to dispose those expired medicines. In Zimbabwe alone, we procure more than 700,000 ARV patients per year. And the country is currently treating almost 1.2 million people. That means 28 million plastic bottles of ARVs used per year. And that has a huge environmental impact. I would like to mention that the, the way forward, UNDP would like to partner organizations like UNEP and Fighter Strategies, WHO, on developing a methodology to account for the environmental determinant of NCDs and look into the direct and indirect cost of the productivity loss and return on the investment and in the, in the priority interventions. I will stop here and I will looking forward to interact with you through the Q&A. Thank you very much, Dr. Omar, for your insight. Uh, I will briefly just recap in 30 seconds uh, what uh, you have said. So, Nina, you have mentioned uh, something important, like the systemic changes that need to happen. And this is, I think, something very important, because when we think about air pollution, we very often think end of the pipe. So this was an important message, as well as all the reflections that needs to be done on the taxes and what how countries should uh, use that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Agavar, you mentioned uh, all the efforts that has been done in this huge country, this continent that is India, and all these efforts, and you have your country needs to be congratulated for all these efforts, which needs to be further extended. <laughs> extended, yes, and all the governance problem that come, because this is often the problem, uh, the, the governance issue. Dr. Kass, you made a very nice... Uh, Lesson, uh, a set of lessons on uh, on what we can learn from what we have done so far on NCDs, and this was a very um, very in insightful. And all all the communication, I think, is key because communication is really the thing that we always come back to that. And this is important in this in denier climate at the moment. And finally, Dr. Omar, this was very interesting to see all the already efforts that you are making on the on the ground with solar energy and energy access. And this is something that WHO is really keen to engage. Now, I invite you, the panelists, to reflect on a few questions that uh, will help the discussion. The first one would be: How can public health agencies help to build an evidence base and investment case for strategic action to improve air quality for health? Is any one of you would like to, Daniel? Um, I'll, I'll start. I'll start this off. I mean, I I, I think my experience um, prior to coming to Vital Strategies was that I uh, I directed environmental health for a very large uh, local public health agency in the United States uh, in New York City, um, and by large I mean large. It was like seven thousand people. The environmental health group was a thousand in and of its in and of itself. Um, we figured out basically that sort of the that the, the New York City's failure to act on air pollution and in, in a really substantial way was based on a couple of real problems. And we developed a strategy over, that took many years to implement, frankly. The first was to convince policymakers that, uh, that there were health impacts at every, at every level of, concent, at, at every increment in the concentration of pollutants. Uh, so if a, if a city reaches attainment of its standard, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be improvement if it goes below that. And that was a really key message to sort of to work and it took quite a long time to do it. We also realized we had really inadequate information about the sources of uh, pollutants in New York City. We had a big regulatory function. We had lots of, you know, sort of regulatory monitors, as many uh, high-income countries and cities do, but it wasn't designed to inform local policy. And so with a modest amount of resources, we answered those questions by tweaking the monitoring system, by putting up additional monitors that would be capable of identifying really critical sources. And the third piece uh, that we did was we quantified the impacts of that of emissions by those sources to move policymakers to pick the lowest hanging fruit over which they had local authority to, uh, to take action. That's a typical set of functions that is not that difficult to do 
within a health department at a local level or to think about doing uh, at, a, uh, at a, a health ministerial level, at a, at a national level. But it requires uh, leadership, it requires modest resources, and it requires, you know, the cooperation of, of, uh, of, uh, of leaders. I, w you know, I, w I don't want to pretend that this is an, something that everyone can just flip a switch and do. At the time, you know, our mayor was Michael Bloomberg, who's the leading, who's sort of one of the principal funders of these kinds of governmental public health interventions. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it's a, there are a set of sort of core actions that are really well within the wheelhouse of most public health uh, departments that, um, that really will sort of move action. Thank you, Daniel. This is uh, Nina. You want to, to say something? Sure. Uh, yes. Thanks very much. I think one of the most valuable things that a public health department can do is join us in becoming advocates for air quality and policy coherence across whole of government. So all other departments need to be talked to. As as Daniel said, regulation and legislation. We know from experience that these are the most effective things you can do, including the economic instruments as well. So. You know, across all levels of governance, if you're striving for this at the city level or at the local level, community level, there's a lot you can do. But without policy coherence at the national level or the federal level, um, without phasing out those subsidies that cause a lot of harm to health around fossil fuels or around high emissions agriculture, you know, we need to make sure that it, it stacks up across the whole piece. And there's definitely um, a lot of reflection to be done and a lot of experience across the board in terms of regulatory design. So I used to work for an organization called Transport and Environment, and we were one of the campaign groups, advocacy organizations that discovered what was going on, um, which then became the diesel <coughs> Dieselgate scandal in, in Europe, and obviously was big in the US as well. So, you know, the regulatory design and, and having also the capacity within the environmental agencies, the public health agencies, civil society to scrutinize your policy design that it isn't shot full of loopholes by the vested interests of the industry when they're in the room negotiating what your standards look like, as Volkswagen and the other car producers were, that's absolutely essential as well. So I think we can, there's so much that we can learn from what's been done well in different parts of the world, but also where we've fallen short already. Thank you, Nina. Uh, I think uh, this question is most pertinent to me because, you know, I'm working in public health agency as well as also sort of this is one of my tasks to prioritize how do I make environment health and uh, environment and health as part of you know some major activity in the field and last two years of understanding will actually uh, tell me that the three things which are very crucial to ensure that you know we build a case for investment in air pollution first is very important is that we create awareness within the system that yes it is a harmful thing it is something which is harming us primarily uh, in terms of its long-term impact vis-a-vis -vis short term we do not sort of perceive it as a major issue but in long-term impact if we do not start acting today then future will not be able to manage it so this is the type of awareness we need not create only at the national level we need to create this awareness through proper and effective communication to all the states all the, as part of our federal structure and take it down to the district level to the lowest level so that we create that case where the demand is generated within the system to act on it Second thing is equally important is work in terms of creation of evidence specific to the local context. To give an example that when two years back I was trying to push this agenda within my own different multitude of activities which we are supposed to look after, I realized that when we found air quality index in Delhi becoming very bad, this provided us impetus in terms of media as well as other sectors coming along with Ministry of Health to take this agenda forward in terms of crop burning in and around the Delhi NCR region. And we found that this energy which was created because of, you know, getting required evidence, the people were able to see the impact of it. We were able to launch our program with much bigger gusto. We were able to get more stakeholders involved into it. And within our ministry also, creating an investment case for environmental health became much easier. Thank you, Dr. Aga. Thank you, and I think I will say three things. First is the we have to look at the health system as a, an ad advocate for the in air pollution and NCDs, though we don't create from the health sector any air pollution or maybe less than compared to the other sectors. But 
in the health in the health sector we have issues already existing issues weak health system is that cannot generate data so we have to look at the how to strengthen that capacity in evidence from the routine data the other type of data i think is also important is from the field research and also it will be good if the health sector can look at the, its own specific air pollution and data and to become a champion to advocate for that. The second is the capacity of parliamentarians and government institutions that has to come up with the right policies and decisions. We need to strengthen that and pay attention because in this room even you can see there are not many other actors and, and I think and WHO and UNDP and the maybe other, other <coughs> and partners can play at the country level role to strengthen that capacity. Partnership is very critical. If we look at the, the, how the HIV AIDS group put HIV AIDS in the global agenda, we have to learn from that. So partnership is very critical to move forward and to convince policymakers. So thank you. Thank you. In the sake of time, um, I would like, in the sake of time, to, to, to ask you a question that, some, as WHO, we receive very often. So what are the first steps that government can take right now to improve air quality without substantial increase in funding and resources? <laughs> the question is, what are the fir some first steps that government can take right now to improve air quality without substantial increase in funding or resources. I have an even better one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one that saves money. So that's just strip back some of the subsidies on fossil fuels, for example. I mean, OECD, G20, G7 have already agreed that they're going to do this. The heads of state and government at those levels have committed. Uh, fossil fuel subsidies are worth over $5 trillion a year. This is you know, what our governments are handing over basically to those industries, which is enabling them to continue to pollute on the one hand, but also, of course, that's keeping cleaner energy alternatives out. You know, that's their, their incumbent position is entrenched by those subsidies, and this is something that could be done, could be decided, okay, opposition to it notwithstanding, could be decided overnight in theory, and it would have you know, almost immediate impact on people's health as soon as that flows through to the system. So, you know, then you have more money to spend on whatever you want. Thank you, Nina. Dr. Agarwal? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, if we can spend on prevention, then we probably need lesser investment in terms of management at a later date. So what is very important, again, you know, I'll come down to my point of if I can create required awareness within the system. And we all know, I don't think, you know, from second, third class onwards, all the children in their textbook, they all end up reading why pollution is caused today. So once we know that, how do we sort of using this particular knowledge translate into action as a preventive approach will really help. Thank you. I have a, in, I guess we still have time for a question. So I will ask the last question will be, what are some concrete steps government and civil society can take to improve public awareness and increase demand for cleaner action? Because I understand that without the demand, nothing will change. Does one of you want to take the bet? Um, so uh, uh, several things I would suggest. Uh, the first is that there are natural champions um, in most places to pursue air pollution, uh, to really drive sort of air pollution advocacy. Uh, one thing many governments can do is stop suppressing them. Uh, 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 another thing that, uh, that they can do is that uh, public health sort of departments typically are quite skilled at communicating health messages. Uh, and so to the extent these apparatus exist within health ministries or local health departments, they should be essentially moved to, uh, to deliver some of these messages around air pollution. Uh, third, I, I, as I alluded to sort of in my earlier remarks, um, we need to stop talking about uh, daily variation in air pollution. 
Um, it's, con it's confusing, it satisfies, it quiets a public when all of a sudden levels go down or half the cars are taken off the road with little impact or, you know, or we, we, we experience relief or, or governments claim enormous credit for improved air pollution in a season where there happens to be more rain than the previous. Um, so we need to be honest about what's going on. Uh, finally, I think that um, from a communication perspective, we need to contextualize uh, air pollution. Public, uh, public imagination is, is captivated by novel things that are not sort of in their control. Um, uh, people uh, expend enormous amounts of energy advocating for things with very little consequence, to be, to be frank. We need to use, we need to sort of think about how to talk about air pollution in a way that will captivate the public's imagination. The fact that it's the in fifth internationally in some countries third leading cause of death, the fact that it, uh, it, it stifles children's development, um, uh, these are things that we really, uh, I, think, I, I think, are really critical messages. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Nina, you would like to respond? I just wanted to add. Um, <laughs> Show us what works. Show the public, you know, car-free days, what happens to your health on a car-free day? What happens to people who have respiratory conditions on a car-free day? You feel better immediately from personal experience, but also people who have cardiovascular conditions, the benefits of even traffic being restricted on one street, if you walk down that street on a daily basis, the benefits are immediate. There were some BMJ studies to look at that if you just restrict traffic within a localized area. So same day benefits, this is incredible. So show us what happens, you know, get the media to cover the personal stories of people who are otherwise suffering from asthma, <coughs> suffering from other respiratory conditions in their daily lives and what a difference it means to them, but also show the population level benefits as well. You know, how much more productive can we be? What does this mean for kids that they can now go and more happily play outside? Um, you know, there are a couple of really good examples that have come through that research I mentioned earlier from FERS, the former uh, Federation of International Respiratory Societies. They looked at a case in Beijing. So before the Beijing Olympics, obviously there was an air quality crisis and, you know, they even had athletes like Paula Radcliffe saying that they didn't want to go because, you know, they knew it would have long-term as well as short-term impact on their health. Um, so they decided to restrict traffic. They took some local measures for a while, which had that immediate benefit, but also they found that when they looked at birth weights, average birth weights in Beijing of children that were you know, in gestation during that period, it had had a positive population-wide impact. So I think you know, once these messages get out, also the lives that have been saved in London by the congestion charge, you know, this, it's unrefutable that you, people wouldn't want to do it. Thank you, Nina. Yes, Dr. Agarwal. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. You know, working in health ministry, one advantage is that even if you're an engineer, people tend to call you a doctor. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a career bureaucrat. Uh, few years back, I was posted in education department and uh, everyone thought again, you know, I'm an educationist. So, I mean, it always gives me pleasure to hear doctor though. Uh, <laughs> very technical department. Uh, uh, having said that, see, what is very critical is that uh, I'll take from what you said, that public health uh, or government has enough capacities to create awareness. I probably would say that this needs to be supplemented by civil society organization. You had used the word then don't suppress. I would rather say not only suppress, remove the suspicion. So when a civil society organization talks about it, if we can create that partnership through which we can collaboratively work and go to masses, then the required demand can be generated. I have a very firm belief, having worked on feed for last almost two and a half decades, is that if you, the vis-a-vis -a, -vis a government employee, the best of government employee, communication from him, and instead of that communication from not even a so good of a civil society organization, I think civil society organization communication goes much faster and better to community. So it is very important to engage civil society organization, make them partner in your delivery process and ensure that we are able to create that demand. Thank you to all of you. Now, I think it's time to open the questions for the floor, to the floor. So please raise your hands and you will have people with microphones coming to you. I think I see one here on the right. Can you please say your um, name and uh, country and institution? Thank you.
Okay, this is better. Hi, I'm Richard Greenwood, uh, the founder of Radicate, a UK clean air technology company. Um, firstly, uh, Dr. Agarwal, um, we're in the process of we're in the process of setting up a center of excellence for clean air technologies with the University of Bolton. It's quite unique because we're actually looking at identifying, innovating, qualifying, and then globalizing the very best technologies to deal with indoor and outdoor air pollutions. Uh, we're already dealing with a company in India. We're helping to globalize their technology. And we're also very active with uh, a, a, an organization called Smogathon, which is an international uh, competition for the very latest clean air technologies. So it might be good to, to put those center of excellences together you know, there will be student courses and PhD students and things like that, really developing the latest technologies. Secondly, Nina, um, you mentioned upstream solutions. Um, I think this is really important, but I also think equally as important is to implement technologies right now that can go into buildings, that can go into homes, that can really alleviate immediate causes of, of, of air pollution. We're an indoor generation. A lot, of it, a lot of air pollution is created indoors. We seal our buildings up for energy conservation and we need to turn in some, in some stance to technology to help alleviate what we're creating na naturally. I started my company because my father had an NCD, he had COPD, and I looked at what technology was available on the market and didn't find very much, just just filters and boxes. So there is technology available now, and I think it should go hand in hand with long-term solutions. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much. You want us to respond? Yes, please, uh, please, yeah. uh, rather short. <laughs> I think you know you raised a very pertinent point. The role of technology and in terms of new innovations is going to be crucial when it comes to air pollution. Uh, do kindly let us know what you're doing and uh, how we can sort of integrate it into our process. We will be looking forward for that. Uh, I see one hand here in the middle and one on the back after. Hi, uh, my name is Nadia Cobb. I'm with the University of Utah, um, sadly in the US. Uh, <laughs> probably shouldn't say that too loud. Anyway, um, thank you for a very stimulating conversation. Um, I do have a couple of questions. One, they're both very brief. Uh, one is this conversation has been going around in health and all policies um, for quite a while, uh, and I'm starting to see many silos, once again, of people doing amazing work when um, I guess my question is, is this something that could actually come together in groups uh, to consider um, with health and all policies as an example? And then the other is kind of the upstreamist approach of looking at uh, training health workforce. Um, I know that the push obviously in social determinants of health is grand, um, but you try to convince medical schools and other uh, health professional education uh, schools that these are really important things for uh, future uh, caregivers to know and to deal with and to lead on um, is virtually impossible. So um, I'd love to hear more about those kind of thoughts. Thank you. Does one of the panelists would like to, to respond to? So thanks for those thoughts. I, th I mean, I, I think they're very, um, they're very pertinent. I mean, uh, a couple of quick thoughts about the health and all policies notion. Um, so. Uh, the idea sort of being that, uh, you know, the decisions made sort of outside the health sector are the ones that influence the health of the public most, right? So whether, like, uh, you know, whether that's in development or energy or in transportation or in the way cities get designed or, uh, or you know, sort of roads placed, these things have, they, they, they have consequences, many times negative, potentially quite positive. So the idea is what, why don't we consider sort of the downstream health benefits or, uh, or impacts sort of at the outset. And I, I would say just as a sort of former longtime government official that um, I think that we shoot ourselves in the foot a little bit when we talk about health and all policies because frankly there's not, the tools aren't there to analyze the complex interactions for all of these decisions. 
The good news, though, is that it is for air pollution, they're really clear, and the tools are there. And so it's very straightforward to basically turn activities into emissions, emissions into concentrations, concentrations into impacts. And, um, and one of the things that I've noticed in sort of moving from local to international work is that um, there's very, there are very few places in which these kinds of analyses are required. Cheap things to do for governments, mandate this kind of analysis for, for big efforts um, so that it isn't done after the fact, so that policy options can be weighed against each other uh, for their potential impact. So uh, I'm in agreement. I, 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 I struggle with the sort of, in some ways, the overpromise of the all word policies, but I do think, especially around things that impact air quality, they're really uh, quite, um, quite important. And I just want to also say, uh, I think your point about educating healthcare practitioners is, is really critical. Everyone knows that, you know, environmental health maybe gets a half an hour in a four-year medical school curriculum, if that. Um, I would invite any clinician in the group to, in, in this room, to take a look at our, um, this new coalition the network that we've created at Vital Strategies called Inspire Health Advocates for Clean Air, where we're providing uh, grand rounds materials for people to use in medical school curricula, post uh, postgraduate education to try to get uh, practitioners aware of these issues. I think there was a question on the back. I don't know if the... Qu okay, fine. And then there are two questions here in the front row, two here. Hi, I'm Paul, Paul Jensen with the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. Actually, sort of similar to the, the previous question, um, the, the, the recent FERS uh, systematic review showed that air pollution affects virtually every organ in the entire body. So as it relates to coalition building, it seems that there's a huge opportunity to build an advocacy coalition that spans various uh, health disciplines. Um, so I'm wondering sort of what does this review mean for, say, the next several years of, of advocacy coalition building within the global health community? And then related to that, um, like we have a strategy framework, DOTS for tuberculosis or Empower for tobacco control, is there a similar strategy framework for air pollution somewhere on the near horizon? Thanks. Yes, Nina, if you would like to respond. I think the last part of that question was for you, actually. But I, I will I'll take the first bit if you want. And <laughs> great. Um, I want to respond quickly to what Richard asked about upstream solutions and indoor air pollution. I, I think rather than mandating a specific technology or solution, because this will always move on, it would be important to talk about indoor air quality standards and ceilings, which I know I'm not sure about other parts of the world, but the European Union has been dithering and not doing that for years. So that's, you know, I think an important thing to consider is what kind of industrial economic development innovation entrepreneurship opportunities that would open up for companies like yours with technologies that you mentioned i think you know this is all part of the green new deal dialogue that we need to be having everywhere essentially so i yeah i would be very supportive of talking about indoor air quality standards as well as outdoor um which we have in many parts of the world um well, Nadia mentioned about hooking up with other, other kinds of campaign groups. I think that's really, really important. I think there's quite a decent interface between the environment and the health groups. But where we could certainly do better is talk to the groups that are working on just transition. So like the social movements, social equity, because I mean, what we're all talking about at the heart of it is the rights agenda and the right to good health for everybody. So I would love it and, and you know, if we can make outreach to like social movements to make sure that also this deal has just transition in it for people that are working in those sectors as well, so that we make sure that there aren't unintended consequences and people that, that lose. And then, I don't know if you know the work of IFMSA, the medical students, they're here en masse and they're phenomenal. That's all I would yep. say. <laughs> Regarding to, can you just repeat the end of your question, please? <laughs> Well, you know, the resolution and the roadmap on air pollution is r rather new, so there is clearly a, there will be clearly a need to redefine the strategy and the, and the roadmap for the, for, the, for the years to come. So this is an ongoing work, yes, but for the moment this is not. So the, the roadmap that we have had is, is very global and general. 
We focused a lot on raising awareness on, on, and strengthening the evidence. Sorry. Further developing the evidence. And, uh, and the next step is, of course, the economic, it keeps squeaking, the economic, uh, economic case and interventions and how to further engage the health sector. Uh, further question? There were questions here? Yes. Anja Lees. Anja Lees from the German Alliance for Climate Change and Health. And just to share with you that uh, in Germany, several cities are failing the air quality standards for Europe. And uh, of course, there are a number of court cases. And even though one would think evidence exists, we, you know, we've been challenged by uh, the evidence on air pollution. So, and I, so while I think evidence is one thing, the other thing I can really support is that whole debate uh, on communicating and bringing the personal story. Because as humans, we, uh, we relate on an emotional level. And as more as we engage with uh, media and can share their stories and how it helps individuals, uh, and that would be uh, really useful. So and from that regard, would be really interesting to hear from other campaigns that we can also share share our experience and learn from another. Thank you, Nina. Uh, yes, Do, does one of you want to say something about the comment? Right. Um, just to agree, I think there's so many city level campaigns in different parts of the world as well that we can also hook up with and make sure that their voices are heard in forum like this, like WHA. Um, you know, there's Clean Air for London, there's Brussels Clean Air Action, you know, phenomenal all over the place. So I just to agree with what yeah. Anna just raised that um, also from that local level up to the global and vice versa that we keep each other informed of opportunities. So I'm not sure how many of them are aware of Five by Five, for example. So uh, yeah. Yes, and to come back on your on the controversy, I think this is also linked to the um, this 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 current challenge of of climate change of climate change and air pollution deniers, and there is really a need for for the scientific community, the medical community, to really come in one voice and to really be prepared and prepare your message, have a consistent voice, and all the evidence that has been building over the last 30, 40 years on air pollution and health needs to be carefully communicated. This is very important because scientists tend to focus, as a scientist, to, to, to communicate on the uncertainty that links, you know, and we have to be very careful how we communicate. We need to communicate much better what we know and how does it impact? And I think what we have heard uh, today was uh, very uh, interesting. Any further question? Yes, uh, this is uh, Tihal Fadel. I am the president of the regional NCD alliance in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Thank you for the panelist. It was very interesting. I want to raise some thought here. As a public health professional, I do strongly believe in multi-sectoral action and the action of beyond the health ministry, especially when we talk now about non-communicable disease. But what is worrying me now when we extended the five by five agenda, although I strongly agree with it, but we are still struggling on a local level with many countries to changing behavior related to the NCD risk factors. Now we're adding the air pollution on the top of it. Unfortunately, I should say, you know, most of the country are really not ready because the air pollution is much, much beyond the NCD risk factor. These could be, you know, yes, we agree of the other sectors, but these are a behavior which could be managed and changed by a different solution. But if we look to air, air pollution, it is there is a lot of solution which I read here. I think it is a sustainability of life. I mean, you cannot ask some poor country to do change in, you know, like fuel, changing in the transport, and they are very poor country. So these are matter of sustainability. So the action would be even stronger when we added this air pollution. And this is why I'm raising a thought here. We have to differentiate between what is a necessity and what is sub necessity you know there is a difference between these two levels so the solution has to be accommodating the different level of what country have to do now 
and maybe uh, to to maintain life and what can be done to 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 as as regarding a behavioral or changing which can be managed thank you thank you for this thought do one of you wants to comment or add Uh, maybe I will put it in your words, uh, we need a prioritization of actions, but I don't think uh, the air pollution issues is less important than the other NCD issues. And multi-sectoral approach is the way to go, and the world has that experience. We have done in many diseases, and this is why it should be different. We need to talk to the other sectors who are driving these policies it's a bit more work for the, from the health point of view, but if we provide the evidence, the knowledge, and what is wrong, and how we are polluting, and how this pollution is affecting our health, I think we can make a major improvement. But if we just now start saying, you know, this is not important, and I think we will be going in contradiction of our actions, but uh, I agree with you to say the we need to prioritize the actions, what needs to be done with other sectors beyond the health sector. Thank you. And, and I, I, I just want to comment, I, I appreciate how difficult this is. It's, a, it, you know, sort of piling on, you know, additional work responsibility, expecting the health sector, the public health sector to take sort of all of this on on its own is not, I think, what we're advocating. I do sort of in, in uh, I'm, I can't remember the, um, your name, but uh, in sort of thinking about this notion of health and all policies, I think we also have to think about what the true counterfactual is, what, what the future is going to look like if we don't act. Uh, the population, uh, the, the growing urbanization, rising populations in cities, and rising energy demand and use without very substantial intervention on uh, both sort of air pollution goals and climate goals will be disastrous. Uh, you know, I was just looking at, a, at the global burden of disease data just for, you know, a, a, a country yesterday, um, and I, uh, I was looking at the sort of comparing the trends in air pollution levels uh, average levels for the country, which were entirely flat over the last, you know, sort of many, like I think, 20 years in this country. Um, flat reflects to some extent something positive because, the, you know, the um, population has grown and emissions have, have largely stayed the same. On the other hand, because of the because the reality is that when the population grows dramatically, more people are exposed, the, the curve on on the number of deaths annually attributable to air pollution in this country was one of the steepest curves I've ever seen. That's what we're looking toward. If we don't act now, decisions will be made around how to deliver that energy, will be made around how to plan our cities or, or fail to plan our cities. And we, we need to be thinking not only about the future, you know, not only about like what to correct about the present, but how to manage the future. Thank you. I think now we can, we can close up yeah. and we welcome Sandy to make the concluding. Yeah, so I just, um, I think some terrific remarks were made um, as we were closing uh, the panel and, and this afternoon's session. I'll, I'll just say one thing, and I say this from, from wearing my uh, strategic communication uh, professional hat, that, that just as we have made enemies, uh, uh, appropriate enemies, out of alcohol, sugar, fat, salt, tobacco, I think we need to think about this issue, this catastrophic issue, as also having very deliberate and intentional actors who are working, as Dan said in, in, in his remarks, to, uh, to make us unhealthy. And I think that there's, there needs to be more outrage around this issue. We need to think about maybe even the other disciplines that we've been working on for much longer and to see if we can take some of the lessons that we've learned in villainizing these other industries and to sort of do the same thing within the space. So um, really appreciate all the provocative um, remarks that were made, all the terrific presentations, and thank you so much for, for moderating this panel. And thank you also very much for coming.